Hey there, Dr. Robin. Hey, Pastor. How's it going? It's good. It's good. The world's on fire, but uh, everything is good here in rainy Chattanooga, Tennessee. We were supposed to be together in Albuquerque, New Mexico to, to do this, and we are um, still again um, constrained yeah. by this uh, platform called Zoom. Right. It's I'm I'm heartbroken that I'm not with all of you in Albuquerque. I'm heartbroken that I'm not with you, Dr. Robin. I mean, I feel like we lament every single week about how long it's been since we've been to, been able to actually hold physical space together with one another. Yeah. Um, and every time we record, which for those of you that are just coming to the Activist Theology podcast for the first time, we record this podcast weekly and we uh, record on a podcast platform, but then we FaceTime with each other on our um, devices so we can see each other in real time because we don't live in the same city. Um, but every time we see each other's faces, it just reminds us of one more week that we yeah. aren't able to break bread and open a bottle of bourbon together and all the things we love. So welcome to those who are joining the Activist Theology Podcast for the very first time. Yes. We're really excited to have y'all listen in. Um, it's been a wild week. When, when, we, when we recorded earlier in the week for this week's episode, um, we hadn't yet heard about the Georgia results. We hadn't yet heard about um, the domestic terrorism that would ensue at the Capitol. Right. And, and so today we're recording on a Friday at the Queer Christian Network Conference, the 2021 conference. And um, we're gonna drop this next week. Who knows what's gonna happen next week, but, but this week we, we have a chance to respond to everything that has gone wrong in the, in the world. Yeah, and for those of you that are new to our podcast, uh, we try to address uh, social concerns, um, anything that's happening in the world that needs to be addressed as it relates to um, the platform that we have. And, you know, in some cases that takes on the look of talking heavily about politics. In other cases, it looks like talking about faith and Christianity. It looks like talking about supremacy culture. I mean, it looks like talking about any of those things, but we've got a bit of a mixed bag today, Dr. Robin. We, we, could, we could really kind of dot the map if we wanted to on all of the things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing that we spent a lot of time last year talking about was the pervasive ways that things like white supremacy and the tentacles of supremacy culture um, use a logic of divide and conquer to establish their cause. Right. And it seems to me that this week at the state capitol, when largely white folks gathered um, in, in, in an the nation's effort, capital, not the state capital. Yeah, the yeah. nation's capital, in an effort to breach security and vandalize the state capital. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that that is yet another expression of the ongoing cultural violence that is embedded in things like white nationalism, white supremacy, Christian supremacy, et cetera. Right. You know, uh, for those of you that don't know the history behind Dr. Robin and I's relationship, we um, have been friends for a few years, colleagues for a few years, but we also um, really established what I think was the, the we, began, we began to see the deep roots of our relationship take form when we were in Charlottesville together. Um, we were both in Charlottesville in 2017 when these same white nationalists, uh, you know, carried their tiki torches and uh, marched around the city chanting horrible things. Um, we were both, you know, at the statue 
holding the line and engaged in conversation and nonviolent resistance work on Saturday. But that was really where you and I kind of started to see the roots of our relationship grow much deeper. And, and really our shared interest to try to figure out how, how do we be faithful in a response to what we see right. that is so violent and destructive, both in our church communities, because we both know that American Christianity programs white nationalism and white supremacy through their theology and ethics. Right. And so we, we really sought to figure out and imagine a new way forward or a different way um, that, that might, I don't know, that, that might really bring about a kind of healing that um, could help us be different people. Right. I don't know about you, but when I was watching, I mean, my, my work production, my ability to be productive on Wednesday kind of came to a screeching halt when I heard what was happening and kind of started watching the news. And um, I was lucky that I, that all of the things that I had scheduled um, were canceled by the other party because they too were engaged in this deep right. um, lament and, and, and engagement of watching what was happening unfold in DC. But I, I, I was checking in with my body a lot during those um, six or seven hours from the point that we started to see the, um, the action happen between two and three o'clock in Eastern time zone and into the evening. And my body was bringing me back to a lot of the same feelings that I had and that I remember from Charlottesville. Yeah. And I think it's important that any of us that are that are engaged in this kind of work, whether we're working in the streets, whether we're working in our churches, whether we're working in, um, you know, in a queer network and not for profit and, and, you know, engaging spaces. I mean, that trauma response is a real thing. And, and you're going to I mean, it's going to come up whether you're prepared for it or not. Um, but it was interesting. I, I really, I, I, I actually said out loud to my partner, I, my body is feeling an anxiety that I don't remember having felt in my body since the day that, since the weekend of, of Charlottesville in 2017. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that, that, um, you mentioned trauma because I think that much of what is happening in this world is, is the result of, unaddressed and unprocessed trauma. And so it comes out sideways. And yet I'm reminded that many of my friends throughout Latin America, um, like I was, was not surprised at what happened at the state capitol and, you know, was remind and have been reminded uh, time and time again that this government has backed um, militias throughout Latin America to overthrow governments. And so, you know, it's silly for us to think that this was not brewing in our own backyard. Right. Um, so I'm not surprised. Uh, I'm, I'm not shocked. Um, I, I wonder when will, when will we as a culture, when will we as um, a nation admit that we have a problem? And I would, I so wholeheartedly agree. I wonder if we back up a step even further from that. Um, when will, do we as a nation have the capacity to even recognize that there's a problem? I mean, I feel like the recognition piece is still so foreign to people. I mean, all, all of us have seen on our feeds over the last several days this you know, this response to people saying, you know, this, uh, this isn't who we are. Like, how, how could this happen? This isn't who we are as a nation. And, and a lot of us are responding with, no, this is exactly who we are. But we, we all, I mean, many of us knew that this was coming. Many right. of us knew that this was bound to happen. Um, but that, that response of this isn't who we are, we're better than this is, as is akin to the whole like we're in this together response to COVID. 
Uh -huh. um, we aren't, we weren't in that together. White folk were in it together. Uh, privileged folk were in it together, but black and brown folk weren't in it together. Essential mm -hmm. workers weren't in it with them. Um, but this, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if we have the capacity to answer the question because I don't even know that a whole lot of us think that there's that, that the question is even necessary. And that's, right. that's where, that's my fear in, in the, in the next step part. Um, you know, the polarization, the, the ways that we're divided, the, it, it is a partisanism has, it rears its head in every single faction of our society. Um, even if that, even if that partisanship is not related to political mm -hmm. party affiliation. Um, and I am, I'm deeply worried that, that many of the, the white folk that I know don't have the capacity to, to even entertain the question. Like, what mm -hmm. do we do about that? Yeah. What do we do if we can't even get them to hear the question and understand the question is, a, is, is valid. Right. You know, and you know, the other thing I think about, it, and you mentioned it earlier, is the polarization. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot about um, extremism in politics, in um, religious thought or theological thought. And, you know, it's interesting to me to think about this in, in terms of white supremacy, because white supremacy is not an extremist tendency. <laughs> It is a persistent, historical, popular, and diverse practice. Yeah. Um, and and it's generally, and we saw this at the state capitol, it is decriminalized. Yes. There were 15 arrests made. Yes. Cops were taking selfies yeah. with 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 the people. And and you know, people want to call it treason or a mob or attempted coup. And, and I want to remind people that what happened at the state capitol is an event that is deeply normalized. And it's, it's a normalization of US patriotism, nationalism, and freedom. It's an yeah. occupation of the state animated by white supremacist entitlement to the state. Yeah, and it manifests itself on Wednesday in the form of terrorism not rioting not protesting um not in in i mean yes seditious behavior but it manifested itself in the form of terrorism plain and simple there was there was no other way to state it and you know i'm really challenged by our our justice response um in this i mean many of you know I'm a I'm a pastor in the in the Christian faith I I'm I'm frustrated at the at our expectation that all of these people should be arrested and jailed and fined and punished and I'm troubled with that because quite frankly in many instances those that were that simply breached the building and were nonviolent in their actions um, are, are going to be punished in a system that has historically set itself up to punish people that don't look like them. Mm -hmm. Meaning they are going to be back ended into a, 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 a system of law and a justice system and, a, and possibly a prison industrial complex that was primarily set up to harm and minimize people that are not white like they are. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, you know, if, if we were truly, for my, from my faith culture, if we were truly the people of Jesus, um, you know, we would actually be desiring that the police response inside the Capitol for those that were nonviolent or those that were non-destructive would look more like it looked on Wednesday for everyone, mm. that for all of the black and brown people who have been criminalized in the world, in the streets, during protests, during nonviolent resistance, um, in every way that we are um, using our justice system and our ability, our ability to arrest and our ability to detain and our ability to 
fine and our ability to imprison, what kind of world would it look like if the breach of the Capitol were a norm as it related to policing because it was how we allowed our freedom to, to manifest, mm -hmm. not because those people were white mm -hmm. um, and the National Capitol Police were not prepared and, and there weren't enough of them. But I, I'm really like, I'm really struggling with this with this understanding that we are looking, we we are looking for punishment because that is how we have been conditioned to right. respond. We are looking for them to be treated like we are seeing our kin treated because we are conditioned into that. And God, I don't wanna be that person. Right. God, I don't wanna be of someone that says, well, arrest them, they arrest everybody else. I wanna be someone that says, I, I lament for the woman that was killed. I lament for the police officer that was beaten and, and died yesterday. I, I lament for the violence that happened, but for those that were nonviolent and were participating in nonviolent resistance, would we not have a world that looked like that for all the black and brown people too? Because what we know is that if black and brown people sought to breach the Capitol, and the security of the capital, they would be met by countless numbers of militarized police. Correct. And rubber bullets and deadly force and would be brutalized. And so it, you know, there there is a discrepancy in the ways in which people are surveilled and policed. And sure. And I, I saw your post yesterday or the day before that mm -hmm. that talked about. Uh, that we really have a problem with policing and right and you know as i as a theologian and ethicist that i you know i'm i'm thinking about this through the lens of we have we have created moral frameworks in our churches that ascend all the way to you know things like legislation that reinforce the decriminalization of white supremacy. Right. And yet we know that churches are programming people to be white nationalists and white supremacists. Um, and I feel very curious, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in honoring and recognizing the radical interconnectedness of all things, people and animals and, and what have you. And, and yet we, we are in such a situation where there are a lot of people who do not want to be connected with white nationalists or even Trump. Right. And I, I feel very curious, how do we steward cultural wellness and culture in a culture of care, of healthy care, without acknowledging we are not separate from one another. Right. We have sowed seeds of disconnection. We have created a culture of disconnection, which results in disembodiment and other things. But how do we actually steward a culture of care, healthy care, that gets us out of this us against them dynamic that accelerates extremism, polarization, and disconnection. I, well, I mean, that's a, that's yeah, a big question. It's a, it's a big I, question. It, and it's difficult because, I mean, you know, a lot of the work that you and I are, are, are able to do through the organization that we are part of, the Activist Theology Project, um, talks a great deal about this work of bridging, of you know, engaging in a, a, a community ethic with one another that does not distrust, that does not um, you know further separate us from one another. Um, right. But it's but but you know a lot at this and at the same time we are all informed by our trauma 
mm-hmm. and um, uh, the the barriers that we need to set up to protect ourselves. I mean, um, you you mentioned something to me earlier today, and I mean, it's a very similar anecdote to what I would say. Like, there are days where I just simply don't want to engage with my father. Right. That I I can't I can't engage with him as a Trump supporting white supremacist man who in certain facets of my life I love and in other facets of my life I am disconnected from because there is I I have to protect my heart and my head and my body and all of the things that went unprotected for the first 40 years of my life right now I also should be engaging in ways that bridge with him that that are that are um you know that that create a possibility for wholeness right and 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 those those two things are often in conflict with one another um you know it's interesting to me um in in john chapter 17 in in the very final hours before jesus's flesh is just brutalized he prays for god that god might make the people that jesus was was teaching that that god might make them one Mm -hmm. why in his final hours why in this time of brutalization is jesus so concerned about unity Mm-hmm. Is Jesus so concerned about communal c- capacity? Why is it that, that that's the prayer that is prayed? I mean, I think in large part, it's because of exactly what you said. It's because this separation, this lack of understanding that we have for one another um, has, has created barriers that we either aren't willing or don't have any understanding of, of how to cross. Mm-hmm. I just this week, um, the the society, you know, everything is online, and yeah. the Society of Christian Ethics, which is another professional society that I belong to, was meeting this week and next week, and it there they did a panel on my book, and one of the one of the attendees asked a question about, uh, I was talking about an ethic of care through relationships and how do we have, I mean, we've talked a lot about this on the podcast in, in previous episodes, but how do we actually steward relationships as a way to heal our divides? And this woman, similarly to what you have just said about your father said, I actually don't want to talk to my white conservative Trump supporting uncle. Right. And, and I, I want to say you, you know, to that person, of course, Mm -hmm. that, that why, why would we want to put ourselves in a situation that might actually accelerate harm? And, you know, so many people, Um, do this kind of labor, especially black and brown folks, especially black women and brown women do this kind of emotional and intellectual labor in a way um, that is harmful. And, and I wonder if there is a third way. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there is um, a, a way to think about unity to use that word that and that doesn't mean minimizing or erasing differences Mm -hmm. but a a way to think about connection unity and wholeness that is grounded in a notion of care for the other Mm -hmm. because you know people who are you know, we've 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 created a, a political dynamic in this country that continues to pit people against one another. It's still an us against them dynamic. And what if we imagined a different kind of dynamic 
that was not rooted in an us against them that wasn't rooted in an either or which is you know that binary thinking is part of supremacy culture that accelerates white supremacy what if we what what if we imagined relational practices that actually um steward stewarded um our unprocessed trauma mm. you know could yeah could, could that be a way forward in 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 a world in a political situation and and because because we've said on this podcast that biden is not the answer right biden will not save us Electoral politics won't save us, but thank right. God for Stacey Abrams, who yes. who got out the vote. Right, this is very yes. complicated, very layered. Right. How do we move out of oppositional politics that is not only present in political structures like that we have in this country, but also part of the social justice industrial complex? Mm-hmm. Well, and so will you? So I want to I want to tackle that. Will you name for our listeners what you mean when you say social justice industrial complex? Because I think you and I under, understand that language only because we've talked about it, but I think that there's a disconnect um, or maybe just a lack of understanding of the ways in which in in many cases, activism and social justice are also problematic. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I have been doing movement work since my days in Chicago um, and thinking through issues of justice and equity for a long time. And like, like many things, we institutionalize practices, we institutionalize um, strategies. And in the same way that let's say um, nonprofit groups Mm -hmm. have become a part of a, an institutionalization of, of operation and being in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, medicine and, and health is another form of, of this, what I'm calling industrial complex. We've institutionalized care in such a way, and here I'm using care relative to medicine and health. Yeah. Um, we've institutionalized these things to, um, that accelerate norms and values mm-hmm. that perpetuate things like white supremacy. Right. So, we have we have higher education as an industrial complex. Mm-hmm. We have healthcare that is often called the medical industrial complex. We have um, nonprofit the nonprofit system, which is often referred to as the nonprofit industrial complex. That that each of these um, um, tentacles operate as silos that accelerate supremacy culture. Mm -hmm. I have, I have come to realize that our efforts to do justice work have also fallen into the same trap Mm -hmm. of an industrial complex that accelerate politics and practices of colonial logic, um, divide and conquer us against them this is oppositional politics that that seem to be accelerating a kind of vision for justice that actually isn't rooted in relationship or right. care or difference right it's rooted in a capacity to win to um, overcome, to liberate, um, and and all of those things identify that there is one 
side that is good and one side that is bad. Right. Um, and that they're, they're the middle ground um, not only doesn't exist, but um, it, it, it is, is useless. Um, so thank you. Thank you for kind of diving into that a little. I wanted, I wanted our listeners to understand what you meant when you said that this, that social justice has also been kind of made to be an industrial complex. Cause I think it's important that we understand that, that we say what we need and that, well, we, and, help, and that we help people understand that. Yes. And, 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 you know, I'm a big believer in connecting the dots for people um, and, and really value that practice. I think the other thing that I would say is there is a there's a psychology playing out in this country that actually supports and fortifies the industrial complexes as we know them mm -hmm. and 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 that psychology it is um rooted in a kind of psychosis, a kind of delusional thinking that, that one way is the right way. Right. You know, you know let, let's just take our political parties, for example. Republicans think they're right. Democrats think they're right. Well, I actually think that neither, neither party is innocent. Correct. And actually, neither one of them are organized in a way to steward healthy care to create a healthy country. Right. Which means that we as humans that have, you know, that have thinking and, and feeling brains and bodies that want to do what we perceive to be good in the world, um, especially those of us who are Christian and, you know, want to live out uh, the callings of Jesus to respond to hate with love and to stop fearing death and to focus on serving living things in whatever that form that is human and, and non-human. Um, and, you know, to focus our energy on the dismissed and the oppressed and the abused and the exploited, we, we bend our, we bend ourselves towards whatever, side of the opposition makes us feel as if we can most achieve those things. Right. And for a great number of us, that means that we identify as someone who would, you know, vote for um, someone that was not identified as a Republican. I mean, it could be the Green Party, it could be, you know, right. Libertarian, it could be Democrat, it could be all of these things. Right. Um, but it, it, it forces us to bend ourselves in that direction because we we are trying to apply our ethics to a system that is unethical. Right. <laughs> we are right. trying to ascribe our set of morals and our set of ethical behavior to a system that does not have those things in common with us. And yet it's the it's the only it's one of the only options we have. Right. And it gets right. us in trouble. It gets us in trouble both from a, a a politic of difference standpoint, but it also gets us in trouble in our capacity to no longer relate relate mm -hmm. to anyone who is unlike us because we have ascribed our ethics to something else versus using our ethics of care and community to bring one another in and to engage with one another in a way that does not need that thing, that, that political party, that, that political candidate, um, that denominational structure, that, I mean, fill in the blank, right. whatever complex industrial complex that is, that, that's where that, that's part of how that disconnect manifests. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think about, um, I think about story yeah. and the stories that we've inherited from our families, from our ancestors, and how how those stories have not only shaped us, but have accelerated this kind of practice yeah. where we bend in a way mm -hmm that accelerates harm and and 
structures that um, have created conditions for us to be in this place. And I wonder how we start to restory ourselves Mm -hmm. and how we can create conditions that that provide for an environment you know we we live in such a toxic environment um how do we create that kind of environment that that can establish healthy care i mean i i you know i i read in the new york times earlier at breakfast that Biden intends to release all the vaccines so that everyone can have at least the first dose. You know, hopefully that will address this growing paranoia about a virus that has been uncontained and not and, and gone unaddressed, right? This is about care of the people but do we have structures in place you know it's not just a you know this is what i get frustrated about with politicians that well, we'll release all the vaccines but is there is there um a, pl- a sustainable plan for care and i think that you know sustainability is one thing that we actually don't know how to do in this country, which is why we have, which is why we persist in such an environment of crisis is, is right. We actually don't know how to practice sustainability in, in relationship in, in any way. Um, And it's, and I think in part because of these politics of opposition, because of an us against them mentality right i am um, i also wonder you know how i mean you know me I'm, I'm such a freak for jesus um i always bring it back to faith or this you know the the um the challenge of christian nationalism in this conversation um but I, you know, I also, it also speaks to our conditioning as people who were brought up in the church right. and, and how we are trained to understand um, both um, who, not just who Jesus was, but why Jesus died. Um, and, you know, as I look at politics and as I look at this stewarding of of relationship and this companioning alongside one another, you know, Jesus did all of that so well. And yet he also still was killed by the political um, establishment because of the way that he was trying to work in, in, uh, in antithesis to the, the structures that, that were present in his day. Right. Um, I mean, you know, we're taught to see Jesus. We're, we're taught that Jesus's death is about us. I mean, I was taught that Jesus's death was about me. Like Jesus died for me. Jesus's yeah. death is about me and it's about you. And it's about any of us who want to live fully and wholly forever. You know, screw that. What Jesus, I wasn't, but I wasn't taught to see was that Jesus was somebody that was killed because he didn't have any friends in power because he didn't have any friends who were a part of an industrial complex that could save him. I wasn't taught to see him as someone who lived in, you know, land that was occupied, who had seen his people revolt against and resist those in power and was trying to change the norm and be someone who brought in all to, like brought everyone into him Mm -hmm. instead of, being outcast and 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 occupied in the ways that he had seen for all of his life we aren't taught those things we aren't conditioned into that understanding we aren't brought into a space regardless of whether we're brought in through an understanding of community and and culture 
and self-care or we're brought in through an understanding of faith and or academia we aren't we we aren't conditioned to understand those things mm -hmm. and so a lot of this for me and and that's why i so appreciate a lot of your like you ask questions not desiring for me or anyone that's listening to necessarily answer them but because those questions are questions that we have to start grappling with otherwise we will not be able to reimagine a future for ourselves and the generations that come behind us that is not like the one that we see now right um and yet you know it is it is the it is what is embedded in so many of us that not only limits our ability to hear the question but also limits our capacity to imagine anything that is greater or or more or or more um embodied and 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 community centric than what we have um and i don't i I don't know how much therapy can fix that. <laughs> I don't know how much, you know, I don't, I don't know at what point, you know, we throw up our hands and say, God, yeah, well, I'd love for it to be that way. But like, I, I don't, I don't know how to get there. I don't know yeah. how to disentangle myself. I don't know how to unhinge myself from all of these things that have gotten me to this point. Um, and so we become paralyzed in, our incapacity versus becoming motivated and um, and in, and fueled by the the possibility of of but but what could happen if we yeah did. you know I love that you talk about how many of us were socialized and conditioned to understand or know Jesus um, mm -hmm. I I. I, it reminds me, I, so I, I did my undergrad in Texas um, in theology right. and then went to seminary in Chicago. And so 20 years ago, I was just, um, I, I had read some liberation theology in my undergrad and found it very interesting because it came from Latin America. I'm Mexican American. And so, you know, I've, I've for a long time been on this journey to understand, you know, my, ancestral line and 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 all of that and my assimilation into dominant culture through academia and when I got into seminary in Chicago um and you know sort of was living in a big city and um having to buy your first coat because you were from yeah. Texas and didn't yeah. know it was going to be as cold as it was <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> you know I I I began reading liberation theology more mm -hmm. and you know they liberation theology the sort of the hallmark of Latin American liberation theology is the preferential option for the for the poor so there's this economic dimension and I and I mentioned that because it was the first time in my life that I had this awareness of the poor mm. And it was the first time that I began to reflect on um, the fact that when I lived with my mother in Texas for the first 12 years, that we were poor. That, and, and, I, and I mentioned this because we, we actually don't know how to talk about ourselves or, or our experiences because we are so disconnected from from our own lived experience right and and that's and that's because of white supremacy yes white supremacy diminishes um lived experience diminishes um aberrations right mm -hmm. they it just wants to normalize experience right and so and it normalizes it through the tactics of shame yeah and tactics of um you know a a a, a ignorance of trauma right. um and it and it is those things that that it uses to to uh you know get its its ugly point across well and as so as you know 20 years ago i'm like reading about the poor and coming to an awareness about poverty and and realizing that 
this this narrative of pull yourself up by your bootstraps is actually deeply ingrained in me from an early age yeah my my mother and i write about this in, in my book my mexican mother who has a sixth grade education said to me education is your way out so that signaled to me if i don't want to be poor mm -hmm then like I am now with like mm -hmm. electricity sometimes, food sometimes, mm -hmm. then I need to work really hard in school to have a different lived experience. And when I began to reflect on that as I was reading Latin American liberation theology, it occurred to me, not only do we not have an awareness of the ways in which things like race, class, gender, sexuality are all interconnected and imbricated mm -hmm. with one another. We also don't know how to talk about that in our, in our own selves. Mm. And, and, and as soon as I began to develop the tools to be able to talk about my awareness of my own trauma and history of being poor, of being understanding myself as sexually different and genderly different at a very young age, and be able to restory those parts of myself. Mm -hmm. Only then was I able to sort of be at a different place relative to everything that was happening around me. Right. And and so I I actually wonder if we as a culture have the capacity to do that. To relearn, to yeah. restory, to, yeah. 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 It's a, it's a, it's a big question. It's, it's one of the reasons I think that, that you and I started this podcast because we knew that there were really big questions we wanted to ask. We knew that there were things that we wanted to, you know, to be able to, to share thoughts that we wanted to be able to share with, with people across the world. I mean, we also thought that, you know, we were funny and people yeah. would like us and, yeah. you know, we were cute and um, we had good hair, all yeah. those things. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we, we, you know, that's the reason for this space. That's the reason we hold this space weekly is because, you know, those questions are questions that will free us that will uh, disentangle us, that will allow us to, you know, see what liberation is really supposed to look like in the world. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the episodes that we watched take place this week, both those that brought us great joy. I mean, come on, Asaf and Warnock. I mean, yeah. not, no one th thought, well, I mean, some people probably thought, hoped but i mean i don't know that any of us had a a vision for a political possibility where um we could at least take down the policies that were enacted in the last four years and right. and and shove them away right like joy came to many of us at the same time that we watched violence and white supremacy and christian nationalism on full display right um and it's in that work, it's in that understanding that we're, you know, trying to trying to figure shit out. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's what the activist theology podcast is here to do. That's what we're that's what we're trying to to work through every week. So, I'm so glad that we could do this. I know. I'm so I'm sad we're not in Albuquerque. I'm. Um, thrilled that we still get a chance to um, chat with folks and be engaged with folks. Um, we have open DMs, open Twitter handles, friends. You are encouraged, um, highly encouraged to you know, talk, talk to us, give us feedback, ask us questions, push, push us on things that you disagreed with um, or push us on on things that you want to know more about. Um, you can find us on all the socials at Activist Theology. Be mindful that activist and theology share a T. Um, and you can contact Robin on socials at iRobin. 
and it's I-R-O-B-Y-N. Um, and I am available at Unholy Heretic, Unholy Hair, H-A-I-R, a tick. And um, follow us, find us, uh, subscribe to the Activist Theology Podcast. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to um, engage with you once we're, once we're finished here. Um, and I'm just really grateful. I'm really grateful that we got to do this. And yeah. um, we, uh, we begin and end this podcast in um, real time with a song that was written by our friends, the band Delta Ray, that's called Hands Dirty. And it's all about how we get our hands dirty in the work, how we dig deep and allow ourselves to not stay in a pristine, um, you know, castle of whiteness or safety, um, but, but get us to a point where we are able to, to move into liberation. And so as we button up today, that's, that's the work friends, um, figure out how you're going to get your hands dirty in the world, figure out how you're going to include and be a part of a community that welcomes difference. Um, and, uh, we'll be doing it right along with you. I'm so happy we did this and, it's really fun to think about having a live audience. I look forward to when we can do it in person. Yes. And where we can practice liberation and freedom in person. Yes. Um, in conversation. And it's really great to have been here. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Dr. Robin. All right. Let's get free, y'all. <laughs>